Welcome to the Red Med Podcast, Rescue, Expedition and Disaster Medicine, where we provide a platform for healthcare professionals working in or aspiring to join rescue, expedition and disaster response teams, a platform to share information, advice and opportunities and connect like-minded Red Med individuals in our community. Good evening and welcome to episode 17 of the Red Med Podcast, Rescue, Expedition and Disaster Medicine. As usual, I'm joined by Chris Sharp, our crew chief. Good evening, sir. Good evening. In the dark. In the dark. <laughs> we are in the dark in the jungle. As usual, we're supported by SOS Coffee, coffee which we sell to fund medical missions in remote communities in Guatemala and to run free CPR and bleeding control courses to save lives in Guatemala. We're proud to announce that, again, we're sponsored by Life Systems Medical, well-designed, high-quality, British-made, first-aid, travel and expedition safety gear. We're huge fans of their equipment. We've used it all over the world. And our search and rescue teams carry it in their safety vests on all our missions. My personal favourites are the uh, the Mountain Leader First Aid Kit, or the Mountain Leader Pro First Aid Kit. The uh, GeoNet Freestanding Mosquito Net, because it's saved me numerous times on expeds in the jungle, keeping the beasties away without having a fly sheet on, keeping the heat in. And uh, the survival shelter or the bothy bag, which is brilliant for emergencies, assessing patients, or just having a rest stop and getting out the wind and rain. Absolutely brilliant piece of kit for any group leader. What about you, Chris? What are your favourite bits Uh, of Life Systems kit? Favourites are the the Mountain Systems, uh, Mountain Leader Pro, uh, because it's a bit bigger. Yep. Uh, I carry it on my belt kit. I love the dental kit, uh, which on the red course we're going to get a dentist in and he's going to teach guys on that. It just Because I've got a hole in my teeth and it really hurts and it's kind of a mission stopper. And uh, the body bag, oh, it's not waterproof. Uh, it's saved us numerous times. It's like a freestanding mosquito net. But probably... Of all the med stuff, ignoring infusion pumps, cardiac monitors, is the dental kit, to be honest. Because dental stops everything because it hurts so much. Brilliant. Well, I like the Bothy bag and it's, uh, we're going to get 25 of them arriving in Guatemala next week, which Woo-hoo. hopefully will push out to the mountain rescue teams and the SAR teams and, and all <coughs> that added capability. But that's another podcast. We're going to discuss all of the unfortunate disasters that we've had on the high altitude mountains here in, in Guatemala and how the Bothy Bag can help prevent casualties. Today we thought we'd talk about disasters and disaster medicine. Maybe the world's changing. Maybe it is more volatile and Mother Nature's more active or maybe we're just exposed more to the international news. But there's certainly constant natural disasters around the globe from hurricanes and floods to earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. Highly possible that healthcare professionals might get caught in one of these natural disasters, whether they're on holiday or transiting through on business, or might volunteer to deploy with a disaster management team. So we thought we'd discuss initially the phases and how how that affects medical staff operating in these areas and then a couple of case studies and what you can do to prepare prepare to work in these environments. So the four phases of disaster management, initially mitigation, preparedness, response and recovery. Those four phases can be subdivided into further phases. The inter-disaster phase, pre-impact, emergency phase, restoration phase and then the reconstruction phase. And it's quite possible or probable that medics could be involved in in all of those phases in different contexts. So in the initial mitigation phase, depending on your role or your contract, you might be involved in public education, awareness training, development of risk assessments, or providing consultancy regarding the development of the infrastructure in the country. Then we move on to the preparedness phase. Development and exercising of contingency plans, 
communication plans, response plans, aligning local, national and international systems, standards and terminology, and development of SOPs. And when the disaster hits, you might be involved in the response phase. This is where guys might volunteer and deploy with disaster response teams on search and rescue operations, or life-saving teams, or the coordination of agencies on the ground following National Incident Management Systems, or ICS. Then, following that, the recovery phase. This is where we get in on the ground to improve lives, um, developing, coordinating distribution centres, providing health care, clothes, food, recovery of services, electricity, water, and the restoration of communications across the country. So what are some of the risks we might face deploying, whether it be a hurricane, an avalanche, uh, landslides, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions as we recently had in Guatemala. Some of the things you might face as a paramedic, doctor, the um, natural disasters, aftershocks, further collapses, further floods, anarchy, social conflict, as we saw following Hurricane Irma in 2017 disease and the psychological impact we had a couple of guys work in the morgue following a big landslide and a hillside collapse in guatemala there were over 400 dead we had guys whilst we were at ground zero we also had a critical care tent but we had guys in the morgue as well the impact of managing that volume of patients was huge so chris and i have been involved in three separate natural disasters in guatemala we just thought we'd give an overview of the disasters and lessons learned. <clears throat> First one was Tropical Storm Agatha. Huge tropical storm built up, dumped a load of water, and there was widespread flooding in the, in the southeast of Guatemala. Massive infrastructure damage. Despite early warning systems, despite the National Disaster Reduction Service providing early warning systems, most people chose to shelter in place which means they were caught in the impact area and they had no means of escape after the floods. There was no influx of supplies. Most of the local infrastructure was damaged. The roads were damaged. No medicines or food getting in. A lot of the crops and the animals were destroyed or killed. So uh, the government at the time had no serviceable 4x4 vehicles. What few vehicles they did have, they had no fuel, there was no diesel available to them. So they actually called upon the private medical services and a volunteer 4x4 team to go down, receive a brief at the central headquarters. We then deployed from the headquarters to a regional supply centre, regional distribution centre, and loaded up, I think it was eight or nine Land Rovers, with food, water... Uh, basic supplies for kids and uh, and a lot of medical supplies. We essentially deployed under the direction of the National Incident Management Team to the, the affected area, only to find that most of the roads were cut off. The Land Rovers without snorkels couldn't push on. It was only the, the three or four snorkels that could get through the floods and, and overcome the obstacles. Got to the affected area only to find there was a lot of nervous people, a lot of social conflict, a lot of frustration and anxiety, and the situation was really quite tense. We managed to liaise with the community leaders, managed to generate a little bit of of a rapport, break down barriers, and we set up a distribution centre, giving out food and medicine on a triage basis. Certainly weren't enough supplies for everybody. Um, Medical care... There was a lot of infections, a lot of GI infections, uh, a lot of dehydration, hypoglycemia. Uh, most of the crops are being destroyed. So what key equipment did we take? As we've talked about before, it's got to be specific to roll. Obviously, the biggest piece of equipment was the Land Rover. Without a quality 4x4 vehicle, there was no way we'd get anywhere near ground zero, the affected area. Until I broke it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> several times, I think. Um, but yeah, the Land Rover and the ability to, to use it, unless you've done a 4 by 4 course, you know how to use the differential lock, you know how to jack and winch and use high-lift winches. 
then really you're just going to going to become a logistical problem for the team. Pelican cases, every single piece of a kit was in a Pelican case. Dust proof, waterproof, it can float. Without that, we have lost a lot of equipment. We had um, ultrasound in there, we had GPSs, we had satellite telephones, pulse oximeters, everything was in Pelican cases. Communications, the local towers were down. Um, there was no telephone communications at all. We only had the satellite telephones and uh, solar charges weren't great in that environment. The skies were still full of uh, grey clouds and they worked a little bit on a trickle feed, but the best thing were the battery packs that we took, really. Um, training for that environment? Oof. I guess the preparation for that was, was fairly broad, really. Driver training, navigation, language, wilderness medicine, primary care... A year later, we deployed to another disaster, which was at Cambrai, where a 200-metre cliff literally, it didn't slide, it collapsed on top of a village. And there were With four. a village on the top? Yeah, so there was a village on top of the hill, a village at the bottom There's of the hill. now a village valley. on top of a village. 400 people buried under 30 metres of earth. The initial response and deployment was primarily by the adjacent communities, off-duty firefighters, later on police, army firefighters. I guess the first few hours, maybe even the first 24 hours, was absolute chaos. It was pitch black. You were in a deep jungle valley, still chucking it down with rain. Um, there was a high risk of a second collapse on the opposite side of the valley. So really the initial phase was response, search and rescue, <coughs> Ideally, people would have been trained in confined space rescue, but the reality is most people were just pulled in off the street, didn't have any PPE, no previous training. It was just desperately, desperately digging away at the earth and pulling away at the... It was a general ambulance fire response call. There's a situation, go. It was every man and his dog. The whole city was in that site, yeah. essentially digging with their hands, trying to lift away the earth and pull up corrugated iron roofs and pull out blocks, trying to get out the survivors. And it wasn't until the following day that the National Disaster Agency went in, established a command post in the incident command system, cordoned the place off, employed security, pulled non-trained people out of ground zero. As a private medical company, rather than go straight in, the, straight in there, we reported to the, the National Disaster Headquarters and basically said, this is our capability, this is the equipment we've got, these are how many people we've got. Do you want us? Where do you need us? Because we initially set up with the Red Cross. Well, that was it. They said, we would like you to set up a critical care post with the Red Cross, co-located with the Red Cross, which is exactly what we did. We followed their instructions, deployed a six-person team, with a critical care doctor, primary care doctor, two critical care paramedics, SARTEC. And there we camped for 24 hours. We had zero patients. Most patients were rushed straight past us into ambulances and whisked off to the local hospitals. We had nothing to do at all. It wasn't until the following day where we noticed that some of the firefighters and the SARTECs started to become fatigued. There were smaller <laughs> collapses I went to report to the incident commander two or three times only to find that the tent was completely mobbed by the media, couldn't get anywhere near him or his, his deputies. We were asked by the local firefighters to go and provide support because of the two to three hundred rescuers down there. They were all Sartex, up to their necks in mud, focused on digging people out. There were no paramedics, nobody had any medical kit and we started to get fatigue, dehydration, hypoglycemia. So we took the command decision, rightly or wrongly, to go down to ground zero with PPE, with a trauma bag, and within 20 minutes of getting there, there was a hillside collapse. A firefighter had a fractured leg, and between the four of us, we're the only team that had the capability to provide pain relief, immobilisation, oxygen, and we managed to get him out there as quickly as possible, 
reassess in the cold zone, immobilise, treat, and then we whisk them off to the hospital. My bad as team commander, my mistake. Um, I suffered the consequences after <laughs> that. I had a, a heated discussion with the incident commander and, you know, I should have known better. As an ICS instructor, I shouldn't have gone without authorisation. But my colleagues were down there injured <clears throat> and didn't have the capability. We did. Lessons learned. I wouldn't do it again. But, you know, there was a lot of chaos. We needed to bring order to the chaos. But as a, a devil's advocate, when you, ha especially here in a developing country that don't know capabilities of what is a true paramedic, what is a true pre-hospital doctor. That's right, in they, their eyes, they, don't they know had what, the capability. Because, for example, here, a paramedic may have done a three-day course. He's not a true paramedic. They don't carry drugs. They don't carry anything but bandages so it's it was a judgment call that the guy we rescued it was a building collapse they yep. were digging for somebody yep. and basically a wall fell on his femur we gave morphine stretcher because nobody had anything and we well you got not me haha <laughs> we got the reprimand from that after yeah but the guys on the ground appreciated that we were there. They were very appreciative, but lessons learned. You know, lessons learned. I wouldn't do it again. Um, I'd be there in the cold zone, follow instructions um, without... I mean, at the end of the day, if there'd been a collapse and we were lost... Nobody, nobody knew we were there. Yeah, exactly. So that's the risk. And that's the lesson learned that you want to transmit. Follow <coughs> the local national incident command system. Follow the their infrastructure, the orders. Make sure that you're registered to work and qualified to work and equipped to work in that particular area. Otherwise, you can become a risk to everybody else and become a burden. Or nobody's no going to nobody's going to know where you are. Um, aside from the critical care post and on ground zero medical attention, my team, our team, was also involved in providing medical support in the rest area to the firefighters and rescue techs who were taking rest, rotations, dehydration, hypoglycemia. We also deployed a paramedic slash psychologist to the morgue. The morgue or the temporary morgue was completely overloaded with bodies, families and uh, police officers who weren't prepared to deal with what they saw. They were there to provide security, to support the... Uh, the National Prosecution Office, um, who needed to register everything, the Public Prosecution Office, it was their responsibility to record all of the findings and the bodies and document everything. They weren't prepared to deal with it. They'd never received any training. They were overloaded. They needed to be protected from it. They needed to be provided counselling, short-term and long-term. So uh, that's a huge thing. It's a whole separate topic, that really, managing that kind of thing. But fortunately, the guys we deployed were trained psychologists and were able to provide the, the relevant support to the families. Um, so the first 24 hours, really, there were victims rescued. There were crush injuries. There were airway problems. There were a lot of fractures, I guess, after 24 hours, Normally, you'd say up to 72 hours you might find a victim alive, but the volume of earth that was on top of the houses and the, and the victims, the weight, the conditions with the floods and the cold, really, we weren't going to find anybody alive after 24 hours. So the biggest risks to the rescues were the, the continued fatigue and the subsequent collapses. And we saw casualties from both. So equipment, what did we deploy with? Deployment into that particular area really depended on the task. The initial task was to support a critical care post. So we had cardiac monitors, we had infusion pumps, ventilators, medications. Not so much for primary field care because we were on the outskirts of the city, albeit it felt like it was a jungle valley. But we had ambulances within 20 metres, so it was literally to provide quick stabilisation and support, cross-deck to the ambulance, and then within five or ten minutes, patients would have been in hospital. So we didn't particularly have primary uh, 
prolonged field care equipment, just emergency equipment. Um, medical gear for the teams that we deployed down to ground zero. First of all, PPE, the relevant uh, overalls, coveralls, flight suits, knee pads, elbow pads, helmet, goggles, gloves, masks. Um, there were an awful lot of dust, an awful lot of um, rebar, metal posts, sharp edges, glasses, all sorts. But it was really good. You cannot enter the scene without the PPE. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it took 24 hours to get that cordon, that security in place, but you're right. Once the cordon was put in place, the police were tasked and nobody was allowed in unless you had full PPE, which was uh, which was good to see, actually. It was a change. Training. What what do you think you could do to, to prepare to operate in that particular environment? Think outside the box. Uh, for me, uh, obviously, we offered the helicopter as a, a flyby to give video footage, photos from overview. But because it was a landslide, the the chief organisation said we're worried about uh, vibration, probably incorrectly, but we'll go by that. Uh, so we didn't fly to give an overall view, so mapping and photographs were quite limited. There were drones put up yeah. after uh, the first 24 hours. Drones were up so you could get an idea of the scale of the incident. And I think even eventually international teams brought in thermal cameras, etc. But the capability wasn't there locally at all. There was no... No real technology employed in the first yeah. 24 to 48 hours. But for, for kind of training-wise, the, the principal aspect, which is kind of foreign here, is the hierarchy of rescue. Uh, who is the most important? The rescuer never needs rescuing. Yeah. Then there's everybody else in the SAR teams, the rescue teams, then the public... And the casualties are last, which, as we'll cover in a minute, kind of dissolves slightly because of the confusion and mindsets, etc. Uh, so the training is really like we do on the red course. Who is the most important person? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Me and my team. Because if we're not safe, we can't do our job. Uh, so this is where the specific SAR training comes yeah. in. And... The particular qualification that we use in Guatemala is that the CREC or the BREC can find space rescue. Not so much what we do, which is mountain or air search and rescue, but specific yeah. confined space rescue to give you that micro detail, that on the ground operational detail, then at a tactical level to understand what's going on. Incident command system, you can go on the FEMA website. Uh, the US FEMA website and do free courses, ICS 100, 200, 700. There's a bunch of courses on there to give you an overview of the incident command system and how you fit into the, the whole bigger picture. From there, you could look at triage, which most healthcare professionals have done unless you come in straight from hospital <coughs> environment. Pre-hospital trauma life support, definitely all of these patients, the ones that were lucky enough to be pulled out alive, had suffered crush injuries, fractures, airway problems, um, maybe wilderness medicine, maybe some, uh, yeah, wilderness medicine. And I think another interesting course, given that it was a disaster, in an urban environment slash wilderness environment, it was in a jungle valley right next to the main road in the city, but it felt really remote because the access was difficult. You could consider the NAEMT, National Association of EMTs, All Hazards Disaster Response Course. It's a general overview of how to employ the ICS, triage, um, infectious diseases, structural fires, active shooters, hazardous materials. It gives you a general overview, if you haven't worked in that environment, of the discipline, the communications, the systems to employ and, and what to expect and respect, really. Then we come on to the third disaster, which many of you are probably familiar with, given the international coverage on the news, was the volcanic eruption 
which occurred a couple of months back. Volcán de Fuego, or fire volcano, erupted. This volcano is almost at 4,000 metres, and it erupts every single day. It's still erupting now. Little puffs of smoke, small eruptions, off-gassing, releasing pressure every single day. Volcanologists identified increased activity. They knew something big was occurring. And uh, Conrad, the National Disaster Agency, issued a warning. Most people, there's a lot of people lived on the flanks of the volcano. Cheap land, highly fertile land. There's a lot of poverty in that area. It was a large residential hotel, golf course, condominium further down on the flanks of the volcano. Everybody from there evacuated. Everybody higher up chose to stay, ignore the warning, or to seek shelter in place. I don't know if that was the type or the level of communication, the urgency, lack of education, lack of wanting to abandon their, their village or their land. I understand there was a perception or a belief that if they abandoned their land, they would come back and it would have been looted and they would never be able to have their land again. So there's a lot of factors into how people respond prior to a disaster. Mm. But ultimately that response affected the casualty rate. There was a huge eruption with hot ash going <coughs> kilometres into the air. And when it came back down, it was a massive, super hot yeah, pyroclastic flow flying down the flanks of the volcano at hundreds of miles an hour, hot gases. Which everybody videoed. <laughs> Everybody was fascinated, frozen, decided to video it, and then got caught in the in the whole disaster. Hundreds of people dead, buried, respiratory problems. Another terrible disaster in Guatemala. We lost some colleagues there. Um, obviously, command and control hadn't been put in place whilst the incident was going on. The rescue and the response hadn't been initiated in a coordinated manner. The local firefighters went in to try and expedite the evacuation, trying to promote and motivate people to leave. As they went in, they were met head on by the pyroclastic flow and they were buried alive. Four colleagues missing on the mountain. Anyway, after that phase, first responders went in. The National Disaster Response Agency did take control, did put in cordons, and they were very strict this time in who they let into Ground Zero. Only people with PPE, only people with confined space rescue training were allowed in. Um, no private companies were allowed in at this stage. I understand that local guides, local communities were pushed outside the cordon into the cold zone which was good to see and the security was far better than previous disasters in the past in this region there's been jealousy rivalry, pride inter-institutional fighting all sorts of stuff based on history and Culture. Culture, I guess. Yeah. Inter or ego. Inter-agency culture. culture rather than local yeah. culture, I guess. And that's affected the coordinated <coughs> response and it's affected sending in the most appropriate agencies and people and equipment at the right time. But I think this time it was well managed. There was a lot of volunteers from different agencies and private companies and us, ourselves as well to send in air rescue helicopters to either provide aerial reconnaissance, search and rescue. We could have rappelled in, stabilised patients and short-hauled them out. Um, but it was assessed by our crew chief and, and other agencies on the ground that with too much volcanic dust in the air and it would probably damage the aircraft at the time. Yeah, the, the problem... In this particular case, and I'll speak on my aspect, uh, I was involved in the Montserrat in the Caribbean Islands yep. volcano eruption. 
we were there in the Royal Navy. We'd been there, been drinking on the beaches. Two weeks later, it erupted. We flew scientists over the volcano to do measurements, and basically the helicopter was trashed beyond all recognition through ash, sulfur acid, all that kind of thing. The problem with this case was, for me, with the benefit of hindsight, is they put too, mi- too much in too early. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Air Force, they flew the next day. Uh, our company, they refused to fly point blank. Yep. The Air Force flew two helicopters the next day. They're now totally wrecked because of the dust intake. It's wrecked the turbines, it's wrecked the rotors, it's yep. wrecked the paint. There's definitely a balance to be struck between the humanitarian will to help and, and the risk assessment. Yeah. And this is where the difference between pre-hospital medical care and rescue and disaster comes in. The hierarchy of rescue is who is the most important? Look after your assets. It's and the look rescue. After your team. Yep. We had rescuers die because they were in the active volcano at the time. Rather than, let's wait until it's safe. And be of some use afterwards. And then we can go in and do our things. The helicopters, we can't fly because we will probably die because the helicopter will stop working. However, if you wait a day, yes, as sad as it is, maybe two, three hundred people will die. But then we've at least still got that asset to fly in the next day and save 400 save people. Save those who can be saved, yeah. And it, it's that kind of the hierarchy rescue, which when people get uh, tunnel, tunnel visioned, vision. they forget. Yeah. The guys, to me, nobody should be allowed in. When the volcano stops, let's go in and, as callous as it is, let's see who's left. Yeah. Or yeah. everybody's going to run towards us because it's safe. And that's essentially what happened. Yeah. It, it turned out to be We've a body recovery operation. Rescuers die in because they get trapped by... They weren't the pyroclastic cloud finished. They were getting trapped by lava. They were set on fire through lava fields, all that kind of stuff. Roofs of buildings yeah. which were buried were collapsing. There was subsequent um, collapses and almost <clears> avalanches <throat> down the slopes. I mean, it's really totally preventable. We know personally of six guys, eight guys who died. The firefighters, if they understood, they probably did. But the red what mist. Do you, yeah, red mist bullfighters. They went in to save people. It's like this is where you. The difference between traditional pre-hospital care and now we're talking disasters, is who's the most important person? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm like an awesome paramedic, I'm an awesome doctor, I'm an awesome nurse. If I'm dead, I can't do anything. I think one of the issues was once the incident commander deployed and took control of the area, cordoned it, put in security, got the relevant information to plan and cascade the plan, there, were, there was good control. But in the early stages the first responders were from those communities and there was emotional involvement as opposed to standing back and being brutal, cold, triage and following the system. It was emotional. Because I I was actually, personal story, we were down the beach that weekend and we we were driving back to the city and it was like, should we go to Antigua for a coffee? No, it's a bit late, we'll go home. As we're driving up the the main freeway, there's like 30 ambulances, fire engines going down the other side. It was like, must be a really big accident. And the clouds looked like it was going to rain because we knew nothing about the volcano had just erupted. But it's that kind of... I know, like, the UK, they've got the uh, major incident kind of stuff. Depending where you are, is how fast that's reported and disseminated so yeah. people are safe after. I think the, the reporting in Guatemala, given that 
we do have a dedicated natural disaster agency and we've got repeated natural disasters earthquakes tremors landslides floods <coughs> volcanic eruptions very good in monitoring very good in putting out pre-warnings i think when chaos strikes and the number of patients and the magnitude of the incident overshoot the amount of available resources it takes a while to gain control again and organize the chaos and they've got good systems in place model on the u.s system but not everybody all the way down to grassroots is trained not everybody understands it and the communication is slow and one of the big things is the lack of interoperability and the lack of interagency communication yeah. is still lacking here. Like, the main organisation are really good at urban search and rescue. Confi Spain's rescue, all that kind of stuff. The problem we have here is nobody can speak to each other, which was proved with the US military in the invasion of Grenada, Grenada, however you say it. They can't speak to the police. They can't speak to the local bomberos because nobody's... Well, they probably don't have a radio or they're not on the same they're channel. They're not on the same frequency, yeah. So yeah. they they are the overriding authority, but they can't speak to everybody. And this comes back to podcast episode 16. Communications are the most important thing on any operation. Without communications, you can't control or coordinate anything or request support. So... After the initial response phase, you've got hundreds of firefighters, search and rescue technicians in, digging through the ash, trying to get into the houses. Essentially a body recovery by that stage. So the immediate area in Ground Zero was destroyed. Hundreds of dead, hundreds of displaced people, missing people. I don't think we've got an accurate count still. We weren't involved in that phase as a private ambulance service or HEMS service. Where we were involved was the subsequent recovery phase. On the opposite flank of the volcano, when the wind changed direction, all of this ash started to land, destroyed crops, contaminated water supplies, caused respiratory problems, eye problems. And uh, we deployed four by four ambulances with tents. We created a joint effort reporting through the incident command team deployed a volunteer mountain <coughs> rescue team with our private medical services, put up tents, took loads of donated medicines, clothes, water, and set up medical missions on the flank of the volcano on the safe side, if that's the right word for this situation. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, there were cases of dehydration, cases of eye irritations, conjunctivitis, respiratory problems, coughs, cough, a lot of head, ears, eyes, nose, throat problems from the ash. The biggest problems we faced were chronic medical problems that had been undiagnosed for days, weeks, months, years, because this is a super poor community that didn't have transport or didn't have money to go and see a doctor or maybe did see a doctor but didn't have the money to buy the medications. So we're going into remote parts of the hillside and seeing people with open surgical wounds, infections, pus, all sorts of chronic respiratory and GI problems. And we were pulling out the, the portable ultrasound, ECGs. I think most of the stuff we dealt with, surprisingly, was chronic as opposed to acute. So 90% of the medicines we took were inappropriate. Because like when we did the Montserrat, which was mid-90s, we're on a Royal Navy frigate, We've got helicopters with scientists measuring the volcano. We've got highly qualified medical teams. I wasn't a medic at the time. I was a crewman. And we went back to Montserrat, which is now the ship can't get in because it's now a lava field. We've got crates and containers full of med gear. We turned up on land and all they wanted was nails. <laughs> and we're like we don't have nails we're, we're, we've come to save you and it's like well they're dead they're about to die we're okay. I want to I want to re rebuild my house so we had to sail back to the Caribbean to Antigua bought like seven tons of nails and it's that whole what we 
envisage to do and what the population want. There was a mismatch. A, a mismatch disparity, and it's it was yeah. really kind of hard, for like especially in the military when you've got medical officers who's like, we're going to go save lives, and they want nails and hammers. Yeah. And it's just like... It can be a bit frustrating, yeah. can't it? But if that's the situation... I mean, and that was the situation in Guatemala afterwards. We, there was obviously the initial response phase. We were in the recovery phase, providing medical care, food supplies. There was a lot of distribution centres. Most people didn't want to move out. They wanted a shelter in situ. But equally, the volume of people, it was impossible to evacuate them. They were evacuated eventually, but most of them were stubborn. So in the initial phases, it was on-site clinics on the flank of the volcano. It was assessed as being safe at the time, so we stayed. Most of our kit that we took was PPE and general pre-hospital medical kit plus primary care meds. But we did take chlorine to decontaminate water. We took survival kits. We took tents, sleeping bags, because we half expected to be there for a prolonged period and or for the road to be blocked or to be landslides due to the heavy rain and, and to be on the hillside for a long time. So, again, self-sufficiency. You can't guarantee you're going to go back to a tented camp or a five-star hotel. You've got to be self-sufficient. No shiny items, just enough to, to live and survive and, and be comfortable. And if you get a second eruption... Yeah. You're going to have to stay there for a prolonged period. Hand gel. Breaking down barriers in a place where you don't speak the language the only way is body language to put people at ease calm them down understand what there was a lot of handshaking going on these are people communities with no fresh running water for days and weeks there were hygiene problems there was infections so we ran out of gloves we had hundreds of patients ran out of gloves no resupply so hand gel antibacterial hand gel was probably our best friend to stave off any infections and GI upsets. Pre-trip training, uh, again, we got there by 4x4. Four four. We were up to our axles in volcanic ash, going off-road a couple of times. So driving skills, <coughs> navigation skills, uh, not really needed for us because we deployed with a volunteer mountain rescue team who knew the mountain like the back of their hands. Had we been split up or had they not taken the lead, would have had to know how to, to map read, navigate GPSs. But on map reading in that scenario, when it's covered in a lava field and ash field, there are no navigational features. Yeah. They're all did, gone. It did change. And on the on the side of the volcano, yeah. in the, the lee side of the volcano, there was no GPS signal either. Or satellite telephone signal. So self-sufficiency is key. Again, understanding the ICS and the National Incident Management System so you're not going against the grain or you're not wasting resources, you're not becoming a liability. What else can you prep with? If you're going to be in that kind of situation with potential ongoing medical problems and uh, hygiene problems, lack of water, probably need to ensure prior to deployment you've got your vaccines, all of you. All of your vaccines are up to date. Go on the CDC website, look at vaccines required for healthcare professionals and for that particular country and make sure you're up to date. We didn't identify many problems, but we were only in there for 72 hours. But there was a lot of disease after that phase. And just as an interest in uh, Montserrat, the biggest problem they had was dogs with rabies. Uh, especially in Guatemala, we've got a big population of street dogs. Montserrat, obviously the, the volcano blew up, wiped out half the island, and there was a big problem with dogs with rabies after, which the dog population actually at one point, until the military intervened, uh, outweighed the human population so there's always that problem and they're really hungry and really angry yeah yeah keep away from them I think the big lesson to take away is be self-sufficient be prepared and be self-sufficient 
we ensured that our team each deployed with a 72 hour rucksack to be self-sufficient for 72 hours. We had food, water, water treatment <coughs> tablets. We had a filter to get rid of the initial organic matter uh, and all of the sediment from the volcanic ash. And then we had chlorine tablets as a halogen to bind with all of the uh, all of the nasties. That was probably the the best piece of equipment we had. Mozzie nets, well, it wasn't really required at that altitude and, and that temperature, but mozzie net just in case we redeployed to another location. Battery charges, we had spare batteries, we had a vehicle 12 volt charge, we had solar charges, just to make sure we had that comms back to base, back into the internet management team. Sleeping bags, roll mat, helmet, head torch, you never know what's going to happen or where you're going to deploy. Spare batteries, flight suit, PPE, gloves, good solid boots, anything to keep you comfortable really, but no shiny items. People were getting upset, stressed, anxious. We start to see some low level criminal activity, um, opportunist crime as people were panicking and believe they lost everything, so keep your shiny items away. And if part of a, a larger, uh, larger organisation, uh, for example, the Red Cross, if you do an event in the UK, like Tea in the Park, Rock Ness, uh, they use SARCOM, it's a big truck with... But all your, your comms units, your GPS tracked, so they know where you are. Yeah. So if there's a problem, you have a comm schedule, you don't report back, you've got a GPS so they can send other rescuers to find the rescuers or else... For example, Akatanango, uh, Agua, Guatemala, wherever. It's a big area. You could be anywhere. And what is the procedure if you get in distress? If you've got no means of communication with anybody, you will probably die. Yeah. Whereas if you've got that robust procedure in place... Maybe not even GPS, maybe you do like similar to aviation, you do ops normal every 15 minutes. After 15 minutes, no communications, we know where you are, we'll start looking for you. Yep. And it's that kind of... In a smaller yeah, search area. Keep so yourself you safe. Yep. Yeah, you've got to have a, a comms procedure, a lost comms procedure, ideally personal GPSs, uh, a bit like on military selection, everybody's got a GPS in the rucksack. Uh so training to prepare for that kind of environment, it's really specific. It depends on where you go and what the kind of incident is, which volunteer disaster management team or disaster response team you're working for. They may do their own in-house training. You may be expected to have <coughs> pre-training. But a couple of a couple of top tips. Stanford University do a, a 10-hour disaster medicine course online with text and videos, um, pretty good. Talks about language issues, cultural issues, preparedness, equipment, all that kind of thing. Yeah, great CME course or CPD course. Wilderness medicine. It, it was certainly a wilderness remote environment. We were definitely seeing um, amongst the rescuers altitude illness. So wilderness medicine... That also enables you to improvise because we certainly didn't have enough supplies for the amount of patients we were seeing. So you've got to be able to improvise. Prolonged field care. Had there been further collapses, had there been further eruptions, we would have been cut off and we would have needed to take care of patients for a prolonged period of time. So understand what primary field care, or prolonged field care, sorry, involves. What you need to take, that's going to affect your packing decisions. Incident command system. All hazards, disaster response, communications, GPS use, navigation, satellite telephones, maybe confined space rescue, maybe in an urban search and, search and rescue environment, you might want to look at how to use hydraulic extrication tools. You might not be the SAR tech using the tools, but you might need to operate alongside them and understand the safety considerations whilst communicating or stabilising the patient. Any other training that you could consider? Uh, the one I get our flight guys to do use, uh, we've done it both. Is it? It's mountainrescue.org, or they do some free courses, uh, risk assessment in search and rescue. 
there's some helicopter stuff just to give you a general appreciation of ICS, SAR ops, helos, that kind of stuff, situation awareness. Uh, they're free, really good. I think it's mr.org. It's MRA, I think. MRA.org, yeah. something like that. Uh, there's a lot of courses out there, a lot of free. I love free. Uh, just Google. Google gives you a fantastic education. It's not the 100% education, but it gives you a foundation of knowledge that you can develop. You've got MRA.org, even if you go aviation side, FAA, they yeah. look at weather, things like that. Aircraft All safety. Safety. It's looking at the bigger picture. Uh, yeah. Look at the risk assessment. Look at the likely situations, environmental situations you're going to encounter. What do you need to live, survive, thrive, and be operationally capable in that environment? And one of the alliances that we've got now is with the U.S. National Association for Search and Rescue. They authorise search and rescue courses of various levels and the wilderness medicine courses that we run, wilderness first aid, wilderness EMT, etc., they do some great courses as foundation. Some of them are online, some of them are um, presential or in-classroom courses, face-to-face. -face. But check them out, nasa.com, is it? Yeah. Or nasa.org. I'll post it in the show notes anyway. But they run a range of courses, and they've got a great online shop with a load of resources from very, very base-level urban and rural search and rescue, helicopter search and rescue, loads of resources, Great courses and uh, and certainly good foundations. You, you've got like your your Sartec one, two, and they go all the way up to five or six or something. But it's the idea is the initial courses you can do with a book or online self study. It's to learn about the bigger picture, yeah, terminology, how you fit in, and also guide you down the path. What else do you need? Because initially you don't know what yeah, you don't know. Because like on the the, the volcano, we were sat in the hangar ready to go. We've had numerous requests, but it's like we can't because of the ash content in the cloud, we will die because the helicopter will crash. And the, the aim of these courses is to give you that appreciation of the problems myself specifically, we get as a problem from a helicopter. And it looks at ICS, landing zones, all that kind of stuff. As does the RedMed course, the course we're promoting for April this yeah. year, Rescue Expedition Disaster Medicine. Part of it's disaster, part of it's rescue and expedition, but there's an awful lot of overlap from situation awareness, where to find information, medical emergency response plans, operational plans, search and rescue deployment, missing person behaviour, search patterns, personal survival, safety around helicopters, short haul, prolonged field care, water treatment, a lot of this overlaps between the expedition and the disaster and environments. Which makes me happy, probably not you or any potential students, a lot of it is pressure tested. Yeah. Uh, which is proven through Google, the, the papers, the military understand it now, the civilian sectors kind of working towards that. We will put you under pressure... So when it happens for real... You've experienced you've it. You've experienced it. You and know what works, what doesn't. Yeah, okay. I can't get a helicopter because it's raining. The, the cloud up there in the sky that looks nice and fluffy, the air crew are down on the beach drinking a beer. Uh, that kind of thing. But it's... We will pressure test you, put you under stress, all that kind of thing. So you have a plan, but then you have... Not a plan B, because if you have a plan B, you don't put everything into plan A. But it's to experience all that kind of thing. to be able to critically think yeah. and work through a problem when plan A doesn't yeah. work. The, the key is that red, the red course is for healthcare professionals who haven't worked in the red environment, or maybe have, but want more experience or specifics, to give you exposure, not just to the medical considerations, but the environmental, the operation, administration and, and planning considerations, to be an integral part of a team, to be safe, self-sufficient and conduct your role. 
And have fun. And have fun. Rafting through jungle rivers, community clinics, jungle survival, search and rescue ops on a mountain, and uh, helicopter sh short haul. Yeah. Awesome. Anyway, enough of my waffle. Apologies, guys. Uh, it's a huge field. Chris, where can people go to if they want to volunteer to deploy and help in humanitarian operations oh. or post-disaster? It's a broad spectrum, uh, depending where you are in the world. Uh, we'll start with kind of... The, if you Google in America, there's lots of places that accept volunteers from EMT above. Uh, we have no affiliation with these guys, but they're credible. They're really good at what they do. I think the caveat to this is our experience, aside from CP and expeditions and rescues, in disaster, our experience is really limited in Montserrat and Guatemala. So yeah. these organisations we haven't worked with yet. I'm, I may know a few guys here, but I probably don't. Uh, so we've got... Check out www.harprescue.org. Uh, HARP is Humanitarian Aid and Rescue Project. These guys specialise in the first 72-hour global emergency response. Check out the website. You need to do the, the FEMA ICS 100 and 700 courses prior to your application. They're f absolutely free through the FEMA training.org I think it is website just put in google FEMA ICS 100 and it leads you to it and you can apply their, their main aim is a global response within, within 72 hours the, the other guys if you google kind of your top 10 you've got ertsar.com so that's Echo Romeo Tango minus sign I say TAC because I'm Navy. SAR.com. That's the Emergency Response Team Search and Rescue. They're recognised by the United Nations. They've got offices in England, Wales and Canada. Basically, you go onto the website, you apply, and they have different squads, which is kind of an American thing. They've got A to D uh, everybody joins as an A squad. Uh, C squad, for example, is your medics, your SARTEX. They do internal training, processes, procedures. And D squad is kind of your international members. But if you check out the website, I've never worked with either of the organisations, but they've got kind of robust procedures. They've got standards... They've done quite a lot of rescues. The uh, ERT SAR guys, they do a lot of swift, swift water stuff in the UK. Canada, they're kind of involved quite a lot. Harp Rescue, they're really busy in California with the wildfires at the minute. Uh, but essentially, you can Google. Uh, to me, I'm from the UK. As lame as it may sound, look at the Red Cross. Uh, the Red Cross, they may attract some people, <laughs> but they do, they're, they're advanced first aiders, they do the APL thing kind of stuff, which is advanced first aider is kind of EMT basic with advanced. They do emergency response, fire response, there's a lot of options with the Red Cross. People kind of disassociate with them. But there's a lot of opportunities yeah, for there's, further personal There's opportunities, the portfolio, all that kind of stuff. Event it's, management. Yeah, it's an option. And then you've got the American Red Cross. I used, I spent six years with the Red Cross. It's voluntary. They pay you for fuel, that kind of stuff, reasonable expenses. They offer some good stuff. They've got some good courses. But if you want to volunteer, just look at what the organisation is and what the prerequisites are. 
Yeah, and I think online those links that yeah. you provided, they have a clear indication of what they're looking for, what the prerequisites are. Um, one of them was ICS 100 and 700. I've done 100, 200, etc. You can get those free online at training.fema.gov. There's a whole host of online courses, ICS, NIMS, radiological events, logistics for disasters, um, all that kind of stuff. If you want to look at the search and rescue courses, go on to nasa.org. That's nasa.org, National Association for Search and Rescue. We're partnered with them. Uh, they offer accreditation for the search and rescue course that we're going to integrate into the RedMed course and for our wilderness medicine courses. If in the future you want to jump on a RedMed course or you want more information about the course, you can get us on Facebook at RedMed Men, Red Med Men or Rescue Expedition Disaster Medicine on Facebook or the website www.redmed.education or again on Facebook at SOS Med Training where we offer PHTLS, AMLS, Tactical Medicine, Red Med, Critical Care, HEMS, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we've got hospital attachments, GP clinic attachments, ICU attachments, come and work with our operational frontline ambulance crew and uh, and talk about rescue expeditions, disaster medicine, and drink coffee. Or tea. Fantastic. Hoofing. Well, guys, hopefully that's been of some use. If you've got any questions, suggestions, or any top tips from your own experience, send it our way, please. We'll post it on the social media so it's of use to uh, anyone else that's listening. And uh, in the meantime, stay safe, and thanks very much. Thank you. Good night.